Good afternoon. So I'm Kristen from Malago. Thanks, Lucian, for the introduction. Um, Malago finds and funds scalable solutions to the basic needs of the very poor. So our friends at the Skoll Foundation know that we're unabashedly obsessed with impact at scale. And so once again, they have invited us to be connected to the session with the biggest scale of speakers. There are seven speakers in the session today. <laughs> um, so you're actually all really good bargain shoppers. You're going to get three sessions in one in some ways today. Um, you're coming on us with a journey this morning. We're going to go from the Amazon basin to the Pacific and then back again. So hold on tight. Um, but you're in really good hands. So I was thinking about whether or not I'm the right person to moderate this session. I am not a land rights expert. Although last night I was Googling how to pronounce usufruct. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, though, if you do that in the UK, it doesn't really tell you how to pronounce it in American English. Um, but we're not going to use words like that today. This is not a session that's going to be focused on the technical and legal dimensions of land rights. So I'm not going to say that word again. Um, but um, I feel that you're in good hands because actually um, land is my middle name. So there's an American <laughs> classic movie called Gone with the Wind that most of you probably know. Um, the plantation in Gone with the Wind is called Tara, and my parents really liked that movie, and so they named me Tara. Af my middle name is Tara after that movie. So um, anytime that you're wondering if we're going on this journey together the right way, just remember land is my middle name, so you really are in good hands. Um, this is a really exciting topic. There's, um, there's so much to talk about and so many dimensions to take into account when we talk about land and people's relationship with land. Um, you can think of sort of the moral, ethical, philosophical dimension of that topic. Um, and in some ways, actually, now, not just our connection to nature, but our separation from nature, which I think so many people in this room are working on um, finding solutions for today. Um, you can also think of the political dimension of land. You can think of the economic dimension of land when so many people depend on it to survive particularly the population that a lot of us here at school are working with. Um, so our speakers today are going are to look at all those dimensions and help us learn more about it. And the reason we were excited that this topic is covered at school this year is there's a lot of momentum in this space right now um, that some of you might know about, and that's why you're here. But for a long time, decades really, the development sector was trying to replicate the Western tenure apparatus. Um, so that meant lots of investments in land laws, in land titling, in land registration, a really formal tenure approach. And recently, we see new investments and new organizations that are focused on recognizing customary tenure or collective tenure. Um, and that is exactly what it sounds like. It is acknowledging the customs of local and indigenous people and society and finding ways to embrace that instead of um, kind of move away from that to something more formal. So you're going to hear people talking about that today. Um, and to get us started, we have Francisco von Hildebrand from Gaia Amazonas. Um, he goes by Pacho. Pacho has been the CEO of Gaia Amazonas since 2013. 2013. Um, Gaia Amazonas protects the cultural and biological diversity of the Colombian Amazon. They do that through a combination of uh, really cutting edge mapping I just got a map from Pacho on this trip. It's amazing. I'll show it to you afterwards. So if you haven't seen the maps that Gaia Amazonas is part of, you, you need to see it. Um, cutting edge mapping, top down, top down, um, bottom up organizing, and top down uh, uh, negotiations um, to help indigenous people gain control of their land. So Pacho is going to start us off by talking about that. Okay. You don't need this, actually. Oh, You're I right. don't need Yeah. yeah. Me too. I think I'm going to exit. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I had the fortune of growing up in the Amazon since I was very little. I'm actually third generation working with indigenous communities, protecting the rainforest, protecting cultural diversity. And when I was little, that's my father. No. Oops, I jumped the picture. No, that's not your father. That's not my father. <laughs> that's not my father. That's my father. When I was little in the 70s, and he was working with the indigenous communities of the Colombian Amazon, uh, trying to get indigenous territories titled. Um, and the response of the elders and of the shamans was one of a bit of disbelief and a bit of confusion. Uh, they just couldn't understand how you could have a piece of paper that would say that you actually own the territory. 
when the territory belongs is to the birds, it belongs to the fish, it belongs to the trees, when we belong to the, ter to the territory. It doesn't belong to us to do with it whatever we want. Uh, this is Benito, not my father. <laughs> this is Benito, the spiritual leader of the Uwa people in Colombia, who were in a big legal battle protecting their ancestral territories from oil interests and oil company. And the defense of their territory was based on a, on a very strong principle that many times it sounds alien, but I think it touches the core of land tenancy, is that the earth is alive and that we are part of the earth and we must care for the earth. The earth has rights and it has needs just as any of us has. And we have to take care of it just as the earth takes care of us and that there are consequences if we don't do that. We cannot see land just as a commodity we can transact for economic benefit. Tenancy comes together hand in hand with responsibility and it comes hand in hand with stewardship. Um, this picture I think says it all. 45% of the Amazon is managed by indigenous peoples today. And in that 45% of the Amazon, only 4% of the only 4% of the forestation happens. That means that in the other 55% of the Amazon that is privately held, you have 96% of the forestation occurring. And that says it all. We have stirred away from our relation with the earth, from our relation with the territories. We've made it an object and not a subject. And this has brought us to the most critical environmental crisis today. So we have a lot to learn from indigenous peoples. And having lived in the Amazon, I learned that ten, you can't talk about tenancy if you don't talk about culture, if you don't talk about knowledge, if you don't talk about belonging, if you don't talk about identity. These are the pillars of sustainability. This is, goes much, much deeper than just the tenancy of a territory. We cannot talk about tenancy if we don't talk about decision-making, political participation, because what's the purpose of owning something if you can't make decisions on how it is going to be managed? We have to talk about stewardship, because at the end of the day, we're all responsible of protecting the, the Amazon forest, in this case, of protecting the world for future generations. So there's a lot that we have to learn from indigenous peoples and work with them. This is what we've been doing in Gaia Amazonas for the last 30 years after protecting 25 million hectares, an area the size of the United Kingdom, titled as indigenous territories. We've been focusing on supporting communities to get their indigenous governments fully recognized as indigenous municipalities, <coughs> to get up and running successful indigenous municipalities based on their values, on their culture, on their tradition, and supporting as well communities to develop and implement health, environmental and education programs, but based on their traditional knowledge. I know that for me, it's very clear there isn't any culture that has the answers to all the questions. But it is between this dialogue between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples that we can really potentialize our humanity, that we can really innovate united within diversity. In some land tenancy is critical to secure the rights of communities around the world. But when we talk about land tenancy, we have to talk as well about territories, territories that have a living earth, that have a living culture, and that have the potential to both tend the needs of today and protect the planet for the future. That's my brief introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> You talked a little bit about the difference between tenancy and governance. Hmm. Can you share an analogy, a metaphor, something that helps people that don't know the space understand what you actually mean when you say there's a difference between having a title but having governance of it? Yeah. Well, um, well, tenancy is the property of the land itself, but the governance is the decision-making process. There are many indigenous territories around the world where they own the territory, but the decisions of what can be done and cannot be done doesn't include them at all. Even their cultural and traditional practices on how to use the land is considered not appropriate. So who's so calling the like shots? So is it like having a car and it's somebody like, else decides? It's like having a car and somebody is uh, driving it and using it and, uh, and not asking you or taking into account what you think. Owning a house and not being able to say who lives in there or what happens, no? Yeah. And the... Um, so, so let me ask you, related to that, um, how does it work? So we know, we know agriculture is a big driver of deforestation. Mm. So it, are extractive industries like mining. So how does it work? 
with what happens below the soil in indigenous territories. If you have well, that's a tricky one, <laughs> for sure. Um, subsoil, no, um, mineral resources, oil, gas, and everything tends to belong to the state. So it's a very complicated thing when the land belongs to indigenous peoples, but the subsoil belongs to, to the government. I remember many years ago, I was talking with a shaman, and he just couldn't understand. He said, how can the state say that they own what they don't even know that exists? I mean, no, we're starting from a wrong assumption there. But uh, the important thing is to have clear recognition of indigenous organizations, of their role as decision makers, to have clear protocols to relate with them. And so we can start in a dialogue. I mean, because we, have the we can have the indigenous uh, way of thinking and the non-indigenous way of thinking in conflict mm -hmm. or in dialogue. And that's a choice that we have to make. Do we make a conflict or a dialogue out of it? Mm. So, thank you. So, um, we started this week at school by talking about futurism a little bit. Um, Gaia Amazonas was founded by Pacho's dad, Martin, who's an amazing social entrepreneur. You guys, whatever your family eats, you're an amazing social <laughs> entrepreneur too. Um, um, he was a futurist, so he, he founded Gaia 30 years ago, but since the 70s, he's been working on promoting indigenous culture um, and their right to control their land and territories. And he imagined this world that you guys are now contributing to shaping when, when he first was working on this, indigenous people had no rights. They were exploited yeah. by rubber camps and the rubber industry. So, so keeping that in mind, mm -hmm. be a futurist. Um, imagine it's 2050, so 30 years from now, um, and your daughter is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really use your imagination for that one. Um, um, what would she say now in the next 30 years Gaia has been able to accomplish? Like what's possible? Kind of embracing the idea of what's possible here. I think what's happening in Colombia in the areas where we work really is the laboratory uh, for showing that it is possible to build a governance and to build a different way of managing the Amazon between indigenous people and non-indigenous people. Colombia it has a very strong legal framework. Just last year, we got a very, very important law that recognizes, that it paves the way for indigenous governments to be fully recognized. And to this degree of recognition, I don't think I've seen it anywhere. I hope that in 25 years, I hope that in five years, <laughs> we can have an example to the world that can inspire processes in other parts of the world that it is possible to build between indigenous people and non-indigenous people a different concept of development, a different concept of well-being, and we can protect the Amazon together, you know, united in diversity. I hope that so can I just ask, you say you had a big win last year, but also through the Colombian peace process yeah. from the outside. My understanding is that as FARC moves out, new threats move in. So yeah. before it was too dangerous to, for some agribusiness and mining companies to move into the region where Guy is working, for example, and now they're coming mm. in. So how do you feel optimistic at a time when there's actually new threats? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, we worked for 30 years behind the curtain of violence, and uh, that curtain has opened up. And now both public and private interests are moving in very aggressively in a context where there aren't very clear, clear rules and institutions. Chaos is a huge problem. Uh, it's a bit of an open season in the Amazon. So definitely uh, the game has changed altogether. The actors have changed altogether. The pressures are coming in at a rate that we haven't seen in a, any other country. That's true. But on the other hand, there are decades of strong processes, community-based community processes in governance, in participation, political recognition. Uh, the indigenous governments are being now formally recognized by the state. So I think that we are uh, on way ahead in order to, to deal with these pressures. But the, it, it, one thing that is clear, I mean, we can't do it alone. Indigenous communities can't do it alone. The state can do it alone. NGOs can do it alone. We need everybody to join in yeah. and make our efforts because that's the only way forward, yeah. So that's why we're here. <laughs> um, and I do think it's worth saying, you, didn't, you, you put up there numbers like 26, 25 million hectares um, title that Gaia has worked with. Um, that's the size of what? Like what? Country? 25 million hectares is the size of the UK, the okay. area that has been protected. 
And the indigenous organizations that we work with to get fully recognized is 12 million hectares, an area the size of Greece. Okay. So the whole point of school and this platform is to invest in, connect, and celebrate social entrepreneurs. We celebrated them yesterday, but we should also celebrate the ones that have been working on this for a really long time. That's amazing, the size mm -hmm. of the UK. So thank you, Pacho. No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to shift the, to the next section of our session today. Um, I'm going to invite. Um, no, wherever you want. Um, Ralph, Jennifer, and Chris are going to join me up here. Um, I'll start with Jennifer. So Jennifer is joins us from the Philippines. Um, she is a human rights lawyer who has spent her career uh, working with indigenous people and to promote their rights um, from working with local communities to UN level negotiations. Um, she's currently transitioning from her organization, Tab Taba, to a new global organization called Neotero, um, focused on securing indigenous guardianship of vital ecosystems. And to be really transparent, I'll um, say that Malago Foundation has an investment in Neotero, which we're really excited about and glad Jennifer is coming to Neotero. Um, Ralph joins us from the Republic of Vanuatu. He has been a member of parliament since 2008, um, motivated by the desire to change rights from within. That's why he decided to be part of government. Um, he also served as Vanuatu's minister of lands. And as minister, he spearheaded land reform in the country and really strengthened collective land rights. Um, he now serves as Vanuatu's minister of foreign affairs. So, I hope you feel slightly intimidated by the fact that this is now an, an international trade meeting. <laughs> um, and Chris joins us from the United States. He is the CEO of Landessa, a school awardee. He joined as CEO in 2015. Um, prior to that, he was working with Oxfam America on their business and development work. Um, he also founded two nonprofit organizations and worked on land rights in Latin America and had a stint as a Wall Street lawyer. Great. Um, okay, so let's do a little icebreaker. Everybody looks a little nervous up here. We have these fancy <laughs> machines we're going to have to use. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. This is not part of the plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to start by saying um, you just have to, it's going to be binary. You have to give me one answer, okay? Okay, everybody gets a turn. All right, the future of tenure, formal or customary? Choose one. Customary. Customary. Ralph. It's binary. Yeah. It's both, but I'll say uh, <laughs> customary. Yeah. I'd say both also. But okay. then, then formalish. Formal. Good. Okay. See, we already know we have some tension on the panel up here. Okay. This helps us know where to go later. So the private sector, friend or foe to land rights? Could be a friend. Friend. Okay. <laughs> Friend. Friend. Foe. Foe, yes. <laughs> OK. Just to make it interesting. Um, OK. This is a tricky one for Ralph, but who has the most power and influence to create change, positive or negative, related to land rights? Which minister? The minister of environment, the minister of agriculture, the minister of finance? Name a minister. Well, I come from the Philippines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the Commission on Indigenous Peoples is under the Social Welfare Department. But do they so, have the most power? You can say Minister of Agriculture. Well, environment. Environment, OK. Yeah. Prime Minister. Prime Minister, OK. <clears throat> Land or finance. Land or finance, great. Um, OK, for, this is related to private sector, but foreign investment in land. Part of the problem or part of the solution? Problem. 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 OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, OK, really briefly, name three countries that you think are pioneers in this space, doing good things on land reform or land rights. Well, I'd say the Philippines or Great. Asia. And Vanuatu, having heard what Ralph has been doing. And um, maybe at this point, um, it's tricky. Um, Indonesia is doing some good potential okay. laws. Great. Ralph. Uh, New Zealand, um, the Philippines, you 
<laughs> you can say Vanuatu. Okay. Chris. So, well, there are a number, but most recently, I would say um, Liberia, Rwanda, okay. and um, Myanmar. Great. Okay, you feel warmed up? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Ralph, I'm going to start with you. We are so grateful to have the perspective of government represented as part of this conversation. We really couldn't be having this conversation without it. Um, and particularly by you, both as a member of parliament, but also as the former minister of lands. So I think as context, it would actually be really helpful for the group if you shared a little bit about Vanuatu's journey in land reform. Some ways, Ralph has already helped Vanuatu achieve what a lot of people in this room aspire to. And I think hearing some lessons from that would make sense. Okay, well, I didn't achieve it. I just tried to put us back on track. Yeah. But uh, Vanuatu became independent very late in 1980. We decolonized. We were a colony of UK and France. And uh, to, go, to get decolonized, there was a vote of the, of the population to get independence. For the political leaders who were fighting for independence, uh, the issue that got the majority to vote in favor of independence was getting the land back, the land that had been alienated by companies and settlers and so on. And so that was the basis for the independence movement was we're going to get our land back. And so when we became independent in 1980, the constitution of the country said all land belongs to the indigenous custom owners according to the laws of custom. And the state can uh, compensate the customary owners and acquire land in the public interest. So on the stroke of independence, which is the 30th of July in 1980, all land in the country went back under customary tenure, under the, the tribes, every single bit of it. And then the parliament, the new parliament then passed laws to allow the government to then acquire the land from the customary owners, compensate them, make it public land. So all our towns, for example, had to be compensated to create the new urban areas. And so in Vanuatu, there's only two types of, uh, there's only two entities that can own land. It's the traditional owners and it's the government. And then everyone else has to lease through the Torrens lease system. And the constitution says the only perpetual owners of land are the government and the traditional owners. So still in Vanuatu, I would say 90% of land is held under customary tenure. Um, the issue that we had to address 20 years after independence, 25 to 30 years after independence, was that uh, we had a structural adjustment program in about 1997. Uh, and the Asian Development Bank was behind that one. And basically, they stripped out the public service, really cut it down. So cut out a lot of the land offices of the lands department. Also pushed direct foreign investment as the solution to all our problems. We had to make it easier for direct foreign investment to come in. And so beginning around that time, around the year 2000, 1998, we started to see the leasing of customary land for 75 year maximum by a process that wasn't free prior informed consent. It was the minister signing leases, lots of corruption, giving out land that was, uh, belonged to the, the tribes without their consent or with maybe, usually it was like a few senior men who complied and were part of the, the deal. And so by the mid 2000s, we had a massive amount of leasing going on. And that was the issue that I came in to try and address with, a, it wasn't just me, it was a movement of people getting very obviously upset at this happening, losing their land uh, without their consent. And so we did a, we had a big movement. We tried to get pushed through policy to get the changes done. We managed to get policy passed at the highest levels. We managed to get cabinet endorse the policy, but it never, the legislation never changed, it just continued. So uh, the movement decided to get us into parliament to make the change, and so I was the first one to go in. And then we did it, we've made the change now, but uh, the change has basically been we, uh, we amended the constitution to enshrine the right of customary institutions and customary law to decide who owns the land. We took away the rights of the Western judiciary to decide land rights. And we enshrined a, a, a process of free prior informed consent of the community to any dealings on their land. So yeah, that's the... Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Chris, I wanna to shift to talking about Lindessa. You, um, you chose formal instead of customary. Um, Lindesa works with civil society and government on strengthening land rights. Say a little bit more about what that means you actually do. Like, is it yeah, a lawyer sitting in someone's office with a computer? Like, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> well, so Lindesa has been at it for 
almost 50 years, mm -hmm. and uh, we've worked now with over 50 countries. And um, that has really been the, the primary modus operandi for the group. And what that has meant is that there, well, let me just backtrack a little. I came to Landessa after 25 years fighting governments. So my, I started 10 years in the Amazon fighting for all these same issues that Pacho and others um, are committed to. And my vision of government was very much as an oppositional force and very problematic. And you had to fight for many years and then maybe you could scratch your way to some kind of a change. Um, when I came to Landessa, it was just the opposite mentality. It was that there are many opportunities to work with champions, like your, Ralph, your excellency <laughs> uh, over here, um, that there are in, in, um, good reasons why governments, um, especially at moments of transformation, uh, will want to secure rights. That's their, often their future democratic base. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if governments are motivated to do that in the way that um, Ralph and some of his colleagues were, um, and, and I'm sure in Colombia, we're working with governments that are just around, about ready to change. So we uh, started working in Myanmar a few years ago with that government. We started working with Zimbabwe. It's those moments of transformation. And what gives us the opportunity to do that is first that we have a long record of working with governments um, behind the scenes, not taking a lot of credit for it. And we have the experience of many different countries. And so what we provide is first a lot of research on the ground to figure out where are the gaps in the laws, and often there are overlapping legal frameworks, both formal and customary, but then within the formal, there are um, family law, there's land law, there's agriculture law, there's rural law. And so figuring out what, what are the necessary changes and then presenting those to champions within the government that we identify and nurture, and then working with the governments to actually change laws. And then, uh, and of course, all the time working with civil society groups, working on different ways of implementing the law. And so that is, that, that's basically what Landessa has been doing. That's great. So let me ask you, it sounds um, really complicated, right? Um, are there ever simple wins? Like, is there ever something simple a government can do that dramatically changes? Yeah, there are simple wins. Um, <laughs> To give you one sense, we've been working in China now for many years. China recently reformed its rural contracting law, and one of the reforms was that women's names have to be uh, included on land certificates. Uh, that will affect 240 million women in that country. And that change alone, which seems administrative and bureaucratic and not very sexy, can be all the difference to a woman's status. So I, I've spent some time in India working uh, with communities there. When I talk to the women and they have their land title in front of them, it is overnight transformational because without that title, they are second class citizens. They don't get to participate in the community council. They have little status with the family. Once they have that name on the title, they have voice, they have respect, uh, their, their status almost, almost overnight changes uh, with respect to uh, family, community, uh, with respect to the government. They have now an address. It changes the lives of people. And so that those kinds of wins are, um, doable and they're doable at scale. Uh, and we see that, you know, we're a relatively small group. We will work with governments on half a dozen legal reforms every year that affect tens of millions of people um, by working with champions yeah. inside the government rather than, and that's not to say there aren't reasons to fight governments. There are, uh, and I know that, but there are also many opportunities. There's a lot of low hanging fruit out there that um, goes un unexploited because yeah. people are not keeping their eyes out for those chances. Good. Um, Jennifer, maybe you can, we, Chris was just talking about the transformation that can happen. Maybe you can share an example of your work in the Philippines where you've seen land rights transformative in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, the Philippines, um, and particularly my people, I'm an indigenous person from the Kankanae Igorot people in the northern part of the Philippines. And uh, my people hold the distinction <coughs> of, um, you know, in the 1970s, the pressure on natural resource extraction and exploitation was immense. And at the time, in my uh, community, the World Bank was funding a project that wanted to dam um, the river. It's coming back, by the way, but this time Chinese money is. <laughs> but anyway, at the time, um, there was huge resistance among my, uh, the Kalinga people, which is also an Igorot tribe within the region. And um, we actually prevented the dam from being built. Um, so, um, and it prompted the World Bank to develop its indigenous people's policy, okay? And one of the leaders at the time famously said that um, 
you know, confronting all these people coming into the community. He said that um, you ask us to show, uh, you ask us who owns the land, and you come here asking us to produce paper that shows that we own it. And he said, such arrogant, uh, it's very arrogant on their part to say that a pa paper would um, prove land ownership um, because he says, uh, how can we own something that would outlive us? Okay, he says, it's the land that owns us. And as such, we feel, we feel responsibility towards the land. We are just borrowing it from the future generations, which is why indigenous peoples in the Philippines, when making decisions on land, have to consider the future generations. In North America, it's called seven generations. Okay, so that was the start of um, you know, the uh, adoption of legislation in the Philippines that respects land rights. And my organization has been building on this because what we've found is that uh, once the tenure of indigenous peoples is secured, it, it unlocks a lot of things. It enables indigenous peoples to make um, indigenous, what we call indigenous self-determined development. Okay? Um, and it's part of the right to self-determination where indigenous peoples can freely pursue social, economic, and cultural development. So what we see in areas uh, in the Philippines is that areas where the tenure of indigenous peoples are secured tend to be the areas with um, good forest cover, um, rich biodiversity, um, and it's also the areas where the rights of indigenous peoples are respected because there are schools that are culturally sensitive, so indigenous schools. Indigenous health systems are upheld, so indigenous peoples are allowed to use traditional medicines. Mm -hmm. And um, there are also indigenous, um, sort of indigenous livelihood enterprises. So they're able to continue to do their traditional occupations. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, this week at school, there's been a lot of talk about decolonizing yeah. philanthropy. I think we need to decolonize our session topic a little bit too. Um, and you can already hear it kind of woven into some of what you've been sharing on concepts of development. Um, Ralph, I want to I want to start with you. So um, there's a presumption even behind the framing of this session that land tenure unlocks development. Um, would you agree or disagree with that? I think um, tr uh, traditional land or indigenous land with indigenous communities living on it. Um, land in itself is the basis for the livelihoods of the society. So in my country, for example, um, we are a, we're, we're a least developed country according to the United Nations. So LDC, which means uh, less than a dollar a day per person. Um, World Bank talks about poverty. In my country, uh, 80% 80, 80 of people live on their traditional land and satisfy their everything they need from life, almost everything. These days, you've got to pay for school fees and stuff, so you get money somehow. So you've got to do a bit of cash cropping or something to get the money. But otherwise, food, housing. And um, we've really reacted badly to people saying there's poverty in Vanuatu uh, because it's according to a measure that we don't have ourselves. So we've actually developed a whole new set of indicators for measuring what our life is like with our land uh, and the value of the land. Because uh, I remember a, a conference that was held by some development partners, donors in Vanuatu, and, and they brought people from the rest of the Pacific where this kind of tenure exists. People live in what we call the traditional economy, which is the economy that's not the cash economy, but you get everything, get your life, life needs satisfied from it. And this conference was called the, conference, the big title of the conference, Making Land Work. So somehow it wasn't working. <laughs> and like, we're like, it's not working. And so the whole idea of that was that, no, you know, you've got to title the land, you've got to use it as collateral like loans, and then you, then you start seeing cash, which shows that you're developing because your GDP is increasing. So we put a lot of effort over, I think it must be nearly, it must be about, uh, yeah, it's a bit over 10 years now in developing our own indicators of well-being uh, based on values that are associated with the way we live traditionally. So the, there's three domains we've identified, which are the values that we want to measure. The first one is free access to land and resources. That's a value that we very value very strongly for ourselves. The second one is uh, traditional knowledge and practice, and partic particularly production practices. How, how do we produce food? How do we 
make houses. And the third one is vitality of communities. And we also get to measure reciprocity. And, you know, and so we sent uh, someone, uh, our main person working on these indicators, actually we sent them to Bhutan for a year to study how they do gross national happiness. Because that's another country that's developed a new way of measuring what it means to be uh, alive, you know, living or developed or not developed. And um, so we've got these indicators now. And the next thing we're going to do is develop a law which says anyone who comes from outside to measure us, that you can measure GDP, but you've got to use this indicator also. You can't come and tell us, oh, you're poor by GDP. You've got to also measure this other indicator so it balances the perception we have, because then it also, it also influences policy. So then we develop policy saying, okay, we're developing policy. This, this community doesn't have much money, but they have this. So you don't create an intervention to try and improve livelihood, get people out of poverty, because it doesn't apply, because we have this other indicator. So I, I'll be the skunk at the picnic a little bit, just so we bring it in. Um, Malaga, we talk about poverty a lot. I mean, that's our mission, really, is to um, address the basic needs of the poor, help move people out of poverty. Certainly a Western notion of what poverty is. Um, but one of our beliefs is, um, it, it, sounds, it sounds beautiful when you talk about land as a cultural asset versus a financial asset, but it doesn't pay for medicine and it doesn't pay for school fees. So how do you reconcile those two things? Like how do you, where do you see some compromise with seeing that there might be economic value or there, there is a version of the world where um, a notion of development is connected with cash in some way. <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just use one example. Yeah. Um, we've got a law that says you can uh, use your crops, get your crops valued and use that as security at the bank. Get trees valued, the value of the timber. Someone does a, t someone, a counter to someone does a value of them and you, and you value that and, yeah. you, and you use that as collateral. So you don't use the land Interesting. with the possibility of losing the land. So yeah. you, you're still producing, the crops, making yes. money. Yeah. Interesting, great. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, you, Chris mentioned women's rights. Tell us, I know you've been active in women's rights too. Like, can you share any other example of what is happening with women, women's rights? Yes, well, um, uh, on women's rights, um, this is something that we really have to grapple with because, um, you know, um, in determining land ownership, uh, we privilege, you know, customary governance and customary ways of determining who owns it. And um, Ralph mentioned earlier this whole concept of free prior and informed consent. And if you use the traditional way of decision making, um, it's always um, usually men. They're the ones who are the traditional decision makers. But the innovation that we've done is uh, in the law, it's a bit, I, I've heard Ralph also use the word social engineering. And um, in order to um, you know, address the marginalization of women, um, we've put into the policy the requirement that uh, the women should be part of the decision making, even if that's not traditional. And it's been um, accepted by the communities. So um, yeah, okay. the, the, the law requires them to include women. Great. And so, uh, yeah. That's great. Um, Jennifer had talked a little bit about forests and indigenous lands. Our session today is from farms to forests. Where do you see farms coming in here? So there's a lot of folks in the school community that are working with smallholder farmers. Why should they care about land rights? Yeah, good. Thank you. So there's basically three things we know about the majority of the people living in poverty today in the world. They're still rural. They depend on land to survive and they don't have secure rights to that land something like 90% of the land in Africa is still untitled. And what that means, if you're a smallholder farmer, is at any moment that you have the prospect of losing your land, which means it's very hard to take a long-term view on that land and invest in it if you know that chances are, if you improve your land significantly, it can be taken away from you. And so you are, by almost by design, living on the margins and uh, lack the incentive and often the capacity to improve that land. Um, and that goes double for women, of course, because uh, in more than half the countries in the world, women are discriminated against either by law or custom uh, in, in the sort of rights they have to the land, either to own it, to inherit it, to manage it. And uh, in many cases, that means uh, as a woman, 
Uh, if she improves her land, it will almost definitely be taken by a, an in-law or a wealthy neighbor. And so again, it gets back to that um, foundational issue for smallholder farmers. You have to feel secure in order to take a long-term view and then to adopt the kind of practices that all of us in this room want farmers to take, whether it's climate smart ag or different types of seeds or, or irrigation, all of it has to start from feeling secure about it. And one of the things that I have struggled with a bit at Landesa is how to communicate that insecurity to a first world crowd because most of us just take it for granted that we own our property, whether it's our house. Or, um, and if you could imagine for a second what it would be like if at any moment your apartment or your house could be taken away from you, do you put a new roof on it? Do you improve it in any kind of significant way? What is this level of insecurity that you're living with day by day? And that's not at the moment that it is being taken away. That's what millions of smallholder farmers with, live with as a day-to-day -day reality. And it just changes the, the whole incentive scheme and, the, and the, the, the willingness to look beyond it. So for us, it's absolutely foundational. And we know, having now worked in many countries, that once you give a farmer that security of title, they begin to invest in the land. Uh, they take better advantage of the land. In some cases, they lease it out and they can do work elsewhere. And so productivity goes up, incomes go up, food security goes up, kids get into school. It starts a whole cycle of um, positive development outcomes. So I think in prepping for this session, um, some of the studies I read were mixed on the increase in yield and productivity and income. Um, but a lot of them supported around a 40% increase. Not bad. Not. But uh, what they are now discovering also is that in some cases, it is if you feel secure about your land, you can now go to the city and take a right. job. And you can lease it out to somebody else, get somebody else to, to, to work the land. And so it's not necessarily that the land is going to improve, but you have now the ability to, you have control over an asset. And that begins a whole cycle of uh, development, whether it's you get to make more decisions in your life, and especially for women. That gives women, uh, again, new ability to, to um, own and to dictate how they want to live their life. In, in the same way that when you give secure land rights to a community, as we're saying now, it's the start of, of their own self-development. I mean, and where they don't have to feel threatened and they get certain rights by law uh, and, and that have to be respected by other stakeholders. So I think a big part of that is just the autonomy that it brings. Great. Um... Does anyone have a question that they want to ask? We'll, we'll have more time for questions at the end, but does anyone have a burning question they want to ask one of these three speakers? Yes, in the form of a question, a real question. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's working. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. I heard what I think might be one of those breakthrough moments, uh, which is the... Um, Ralph's point about making it law that to measure the indicators, they have to take into account your own measurements in terms of traditional values, vitality of the community. And I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists what they think about that, because from a campaigning perspective, I should say I'm from Global Witness, we're a campaigning organization, to actually campaign for that across the globe could actually start changing the dynamic um, that we currently have. So I just bit, I, I want to test the realism. I would also like to ask that question of Jose over there. Thank you. Great. Jennifer, do you want to comment on that? Yes, definitely. One of the things that we've been doing in order to make indigenous peoples more visible is some, uh, some sort of community-based monitoring. And one of the questions we had in our tool, were, uh, one of the sets of questions was about poverty. And we made the mistake of you know, using the mainstream definition of poverty. How many times do you eat in a day, et cetera? And they, they schooled us, basically. They said, that's not how we measure poverty. So it resonates completely with us. Um, we have to, uh, what, what Ralph is doing in Vanuatu, we have to find alternative ways to define poverty for indigenous peoples. And they said, if we can access our land, if we have a garden where we can get uh, nutritious food. So um, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good campaign point. Um, yeah, um, I also love this. And I think it goes back to a larger point that it really is, at the end of the day, development is all about power. And what indigenous communities and women and smallholder farmers and landless deal with fundamentally is day in and day out, they are powerless against more powerful forces. And who gets to dictate how poverty is defined? Um, the only, or who gets to dictate whether a company can come into indigenous lands or whether a woman can sell her crops or not and, and, and retain it. It's all about, do you have control over that territory or over that asset? And once you do, then you can begin to decide a little bit more how you want to actually develop. 
as a community or as a family or whatever it is. And, but so much of it starts with that control over land. Great. Any other question right now? We'll come, we'll come back. They're going to come speak in a second. <laughs> Jagdish? Yeah. Oh, wait for the microphone. <clears throat> it's a question for you also, but of course the panel. Do you find this nomenclature of customary and formal, isn't customary also formal for the village people? What do you see that in the indigenous people? Don't they see customary law very formally? I yeah, it, it, it depends. I mean, if you, if you define it as such, as we have, it's in the Constitution. It is. It, land is owned according to custom law. That's in the Constitution. Right. And then we've, had, then we've created laws to try and um, have it implemented. So we just define this. Uh, we call it a nakamal. It's, it's the decision-making, traditional decision-making place. And then created these rules just to allow that space to make decisions about land in a way that uh, is inclusive and not corrupt. So that's our job, we just frame it. The state frames this space and says this is the space that the community according to its customary law will decide. I think, happens. Jagdish, what you're highlighting that's really important is that customary doesn't mean it's not sophisticated or robust, right? It just means based on the customs of, of the people in that place. Yeah, right? so we, we had to make that important constitutional change because what was happening before that uh, change was that decisions were being made according to custom, but then someone who was the aggrieved person was going to the Western court, and then the Western courts were dominant according to the law. Right. So we had to change the constitution to say, when you just make decisions about land, you cannot go to the Western court. It finishes there. Hmm. Great. And so we empowered customary law. One more question, and then we'll move to our next session. Hi, I'm Michael Taylor. I work for the International Land Coalition, which is a global network of organizations working uh, on land rights, including Landessa. Uh, and I think what's really striking about these brilliant examples from Vanuatu and Guy Amazonas is, is your success, not just in securing recognition uh, of, of the customary owners of the territory, but, but enabling a whole governance system around that uh, that, that, that builds then on, on the culture and tradition of the people there. But the reality is, if you look around the world, that's very unusual. There are not many countries where the customary uh, governance systems and the values and everything that comes with that has, has been formalized to that extent. And I'd be really interested to know how many other, other countries or indigenous peoples groups from, from, from other places have come and, and learned and been inspired what you've done and, and, and started to, to try and take that back to their own places. Ralph, do you want to respond to that? We, we have, I mean, we have a, a number of uh, cases in the Pacific where it works, but the Pacific is so small, you know, and we can do it. We're like a little petri dish, so we can do it in countries. For example, Cook Islands, their, their whole exclusive economic zone, which is, you know, lots of square kilometers of sea, is all managed according to customary law. Uh, but yeah, it's true that uh, I don't know many other examples outside the Pacific. I mean, I know the territories, large territories, but I know there's a lot of challenges. Okay, we're going to shift, save your questions for the, for the end of the session. Thank you so much to our three amazing rock star speakers for now. We'll be back. Now we're gonna we're gonna go back to the Amazon, back to Colombia even, um, and invite Carolina Gill, who's the Colombia director for Amazon Conservation Team, a school award winner, and Jose de los Santos Sana, who is the governor of the Kogi people in the Sierra Nevada. And to start, we're just gonna really briefly help bring everyone back to Colombia and the Sierra Nevada by showing a, a short video.
Governor, we are so grateful that you came such a long way from such a beautiful place to be with us today. Um, I think so often we are having this conversation without the protagonist, um, so it's really nice to have you here. And what we haven't talked as much about today is the spiritual side of, um, of land rights. Can you share a little bit about the special place um, that you're from, Sierra Nevada, and how you think about sacred sites and how that's linked to land rights? Um, <coughs> agradecer a ustedes eh, a la representación de la Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, Colombia Norte. Yo soy el líder representando la Sierra Nevada, los cuatro pueblos. Eh, hablar del territorio es muy importante para nosotros los indígenas. El territorio es nuestra madre. El territorio es, es, es la garantía del futuro humanidad. Sin territorio no somos nada. La Sierra Nevada para nosotros consideramos un territorio sagrado, corazón del mundo. Solo 45 kilómetros tiene tres pisos térmicos. Eh, frío, calientes y templados. Para nosotros, los pueblos indígenas, hemos venido de muchos años viviendo en ese espacio del territorio. Somos descenden descendencias de Taironas. Para los indígenas, eh, el territorio es nuestra madre. Nosotros los indígenas tenemos un acuerdo espiritual con la naturaleza. Es convivir con aguas, convivir con tierras, convivir con piedras, convivir con los ríos, convivir con los animales. Desde ahí nos ordenamos nuestra vida humanos. Desde allí nos organizamos nuestros pensamientos. Eh, territorio ancestral de, lo, de las sierras, nosotros antiguamente, antes de las conquista, conquistas del, de, de las colonias, vivimos un territorio colectivo que hoy a, a privatizar, a tener cada pegasos con dueños privados, se nos convierte a nosotros como un problema. De todas maneras, desde 500 años hasta acá, nosotros, el pueblo de las sierras, somos 100.000 habitantes. Hasta ahora, más de 500 años, hemos recuperado 615.000 hectáreas para los indígenas y nuestra lucha es consolidar completamente nuestro territorio ancestral, que es 1.080.000 hectáreas, donde nos corresponde, pueblo de las sierras, estar allí. Para nosotros es, territorio es una casa, territorio es una organización espiritual, territorio es ahí donde está la ciencia de las culturas, ahí so aprendemos. Thank you. So can you help us understand how you've worked with Amazon Conservation Team in Colombia to help secure your recognition of that land? Bueno, con los grupos eh, que nos ayuda en el momento, como la organización ACT, son los que nosotros hemos con conocido en el camino Solo lo, lo que le hemos dicho, nosotros no necesitamos hacer nuevo programa ambiental para la protección de agua, sino necesitamos apoyos, que esos apoyos, esos modelos, 
esa visión de conservar, de proteger, cuidar, necesitamos es recuperar el territorio. Y el grupo de, de ACT, o la organización, lo que nos ha venido es, con muchos respetos, eh, con la guía de nosotros, donde nos le estamos diciendo esto es lo que nosotros queremos. Allá hablamos sobre la recuperación del territorio sagrado y hemos recuperado eh, 260 hectáreas donde queremos, donde es como en la historia estamos recuperando un territorio ancestral que hemos perdido muchos años en, ahí al, a la orilla del mar y ese tener acceso al mar recuperamos el espacio sagrado recuperamos los usos materiales del mar que necesitamos para hacer los trabajos espiritual recuperamos la conexión de los espacios sagrados en la parte baja que hemos perdido y esos trabajos para nosotros es muy importante porque nosotros eso es lo que nosotros necesitamos Thank you. Thank you. So, Carolina, building on that, maybe through the example of your support in the Sierra Nevadas, but also more broadly, your work in other parts of Colombia, can you help us understand what role you see for Amazon Conservation Team to help realize the, the aspirations of indigenous <laughs> leaders like the governor to reclaim their lands? Sí, no, una cosa importante que quiero eh, como resaltar es eh, en conservación siempre nos preguntan cuál es la teoría de cambio y creo que el cabildo gobernador es eh, un agente de cambio. ¿sí? Eh, siempre preguntan qué es lo novedoso, eh, cuáles son las nuevas ideas para conservación, siempre están pidiendo nuevos emprendimientos, qué es bueno, qué es malo y para quienes trabajamos al lado de ellos y aprendemos de ellos, es muy difícil todo el tiempo estar justificando que la respuesta es milenaria. Los verdaderos agentes de cambio son las comunidades indígenas, los afros, los campesinos, las mujeres, los jóvenes que viven en zonas rurales. Y se van a preguntar por qué. Es bastante sencillo, porque tienen una relación directa con los bosques, con las sabanas, con los ríos porque tienen una relación de dependencia y tienen, eh, digamos, una valoración profunda de esa relación que hay con el bosque y con la naturaleza. Y el gobernador decía, nosotros tenemos un acuerdo con la naturaleza y tienen una conciencia de que dependen de los bosques. Tienen, digamos, saben realmente que dependen de, nos, de los bosques. Nosotros en las ciudades, paradójicamente, tenemos una desconexión con esos bosques. Acá tenemos una botella de agua lindísima. El agua viene de los bosques. Todo este auditorio está construido en madera de los bosques. ¿Sí? Entonces, esta es la teoría de cambio. Él es un emprendedor milenario. La respuesta está en ellos. Eh, los bosques son la respuesta y por eso Amazon que trabaja supuestamente en conservación, realmente lo que hacemos es, eh, bajo la orientación de ellos, acompañar esos procesos por la recuperación fundamental de sus territorios. Y en ese caso específico, eh, con los pueblos de la sierra, un proceso muy bonito de recuperar sus sitios sagrados. Es decir, decirle al Estado, este es mi sitio sagrado, tengo un derecho consuetudinario sobre ese sitio sagrado, pero tengo que adelantar miles de trámites occidentales, burocráticos, para recuperar ese sitio sagrado. Y entender todos esos trámites burocráticos y poder ser un puente con ellos para que recuperen esos sitios sagrados, pero no solamente los sitios okay. sagrados, también sus reservas indígenas, tanto para eh, indígenas como campesinos, eh, y afros, ese es un poco como el, el punto en que nos hemos concentrado en los últimos años. Sin tierra no hay gobernanza primaria. No podemos hablar de gobernanza cuando hay 
todavía muchas comunidades locales, particularmente en Colombia, que no tienen títulos. Y ese ha sido un poco el esfuerzo en el que nos hemos concentrado y por eso en un foro de emprendimiento yo me siento muy sí. orgullosa de estar con yeah. un agente de cambio como es el Cabildo Gobernador y lo que él representa. So, you have a really interesting perspective on this topic because before you joined Amazon Conservation Team, you were in a senior role at the National Park Service. So, you've been both on the side of government and now on the side of an NGO working to support um, indigenous communities and people um, in working with the government. How does your time at the National Park Service influence how you think about engaging with government now? Yo empecé muy jovencita trabajando como guardaparque voluntaria eh, en, en áreas protegidas en, en Colombia. Eh, pero tuve la oportunidad eh, cuando trabajé muy joven en parques y luego cuando entré a la subdirección administrativa, que es la que maneja eh, los recursos de las áreas protegidas en Colombia, eh, siempre sentía que había una relación muy importante de las comunidades locales en la protección de los bosques. Y sin demeritar, en el caso colombiano, por supuesto, el rol de las áreas protegidas, eh, creo que las comunidades hoy, los territorios colectivos de las comunidades son la estrategia más clara de conservación. ¿sí? Eh, grandes recursos se invierten en conservación hoy en el mundo, una tercera parte de esos recursos llega a las comunidades locales quienes están, digamos, haciendo la conservación casi a un costo cero y eh, con un esfuerzo gigantesco porque no solamente significa la defensa de sus territorios, toda la presión cultural que hay, sino también, al menos en el caso colombiano, sí. están expuestos incluso eh, con su vida, eh, con su seguridad, eh, perseguidos un poco por el tema de la defensa de la tierra. So I'm grateful you're the first person that brought up cost today. Um, can you can you say something about the cost effectiveness of indigenous guardianship and stewardship compared to alternatives like national parks? Um, I think I don't know if this is also true in Colombia, but from some of the data we've seen. Um, Indigen there's, there's actually evidence that indigenous stewardship has better results than national park systems, which certainly are very important, but just demonstrating that indigenous people are vital stewards. Sí, insisto, eh, no quiero demeritar los, las áreas protegidas. De hecho, Amazon ha trabajado en la declaración de nosotros como ACT hemos trabajado o apoyado a comunidades en la declaración de áreas protegidas en el Piedemonte Andino Amazónico, digamos como experiencias de comanejo, Gaia también lo ha hecho. Es una figura muy importante porque le, le da una protección particular en Colombia, no solamente protege eh, esos valores de conservación, sino también el subsuelo y no se podrían adelantar actividades extractivas como minería o petróleo pero en términos de la capacidad y de eso que es gobernar los bosques, quienes están presentes en el territorio son las comunidades locales. Para el servicio de parques nacionales es muy difícil. Pongo el ejemplo de un área protegida como Chiribiquete, que son más de 3 millones de hectáreas, tener funcionarios alrededor de todo el área protegida. Pero las comunidades locales viven en esos territorios. Las comunidades locales hacen su vida y tienen relación con esos bosques. Entonces creo que esa es una respuesta efectiva de por qué vale la pena eh, enfocar los esfuerzos en apoyar a estas comunidades locales que además lo hacen casi a costo cero. En términos de los recursos, por ejemplo, en el, en el caso colombiano que reciben del Estado, eh, reciben menos del 0.56% del presupuesto nacional para proteger más del 30% del territorio colombiano, ¿sí? A veces la gente tiene la sensación de que la conservación solo está en manos de las áreas protegidas, pero el esfuerzo gigantesco en conservación lo están haciendo las comunidades locales 
sus bosques son grandes sumideros de carbono, eh, están, digamos, importantes sí. para todo el tema del agua. Incluso hay cifras que demuestran que las tasas de deforestación son menores al interior de los territorios indígenas, de los territorios afros, que en muchas áreas okay. protegidas. La conservación estricta tiene que empezar so, a replantearse. Okay. So, Governor, I want to ask another question of you. We had a question about how you actually measure the well-being of your people. How do you think about measurement? Bueno, eh, es un, una pregunta difícil, pero nosotros somos, somos humanos, yeah. somos personas que hemos vivido muchos años junto con la naturaleza. Los pueblos indígenas de las sierras, nosotros tenemos una estrategia de dejar 70% para la conservación de cuenca hídrica, del bosque, del aire, toda la integralidad y el 30% para los usos eh, agrícolas para sostener a la familia. Por eso cuando hablan digamos del gobierno nacional o internacional que los indígenas se encuentran la última pobreza de extremas, yo creo que es un, una expresión que nos golpea. Nosotros no somos, tenemos aguas, tenemos alimentos, tenemos aire puro, alimentos naturales 100%. Eh, lo que nos ha quitado es el territorio, el espacio, un indígena sin tierra, no es indígena, igual los campesinos, no sería campesinos, no somos eh, de esos propiedad de inmenso para cultivo, gran extensión, sino campesinos e indígenas. Hemos vivido muchos años con nuestros modelos de vivir en las planetas. Creo que hoy este planeta Tierra necesita la articulación del modelo integral porque eso es lo que hemos vivido de muchos años. Entonces, muchas veces creen eh, no indígenas que vamos a enseñar a producir indígena, a, a educar con a medio ambiente, capacitación. Creo que nosotros no lo necesitamos, porque nosotros hemos vivido. Y hay pruebas que se hacen en el estudio científico. Estudio científico donde estamos nosotros en el agua más limpias, el aire puro, la conservación completa que donde está en la parte baja en la sociedad eh, humana que no es indígena, tiene el agua negra, eh, de, no hay bosques, eh, cambio. Por eso ya estamos atravesando los mamos. Nuestro sabio decía: el mismo, el mismo agua va a hablar, el mismo la tierra va a hablar. El mismo aire habla, el mismo el, el, el sol va a hablar y nosotros no va a tener el humanos en el mundial, no va a tener recursos para parar eso, think, yeah. que hoy lo llama cambio, cambio climático, Thank fenómeno you. natural y calentamiento global. Thank you. I think those are the right measures. <laughs> um, okay, I want to invite all, thank you so much, both of you, stay here. I'm going to invite really briefly the rest of our speakers back up. <laughs> yeah, there's more chairs, yeah. <laughs> I don't need one, actually, I'll just, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, does anyone else have a burning question for our speakers? Here's one, yeah. Hi, I am from Panama. And keep, um, we only have a little time, so keep it really short. All right, I'm from Panama, and um, we struggle a lot with the constitutional rights because immediately they convert it to possessory rights, and then we have the indigenous communities and the, and the how do you say, campesinos? Okay, um, selling it to private enterprises to build hotels and you know to deforest and all the rest. How do you deal with that in Vanuatu? Um, we need. I mean, the the key is this term fear 
free prior informed consent and to make sure that uh, the owners of the land, or the stewards of the land, the, the, the community whose land it is, uh, participates in any dealings with the land in the most transparent way and everyone's involved in. So that, that has been a problem. Uh, it's it's uh, notification and it's making sure we, we with the laws in place to make sure that when these deals are discussed, everyone has to be there and everyone has to participate and people have the right to object. So th there's a legal process that we put in place. We learned after this long period of leases being given out and we found, we found out that there were just like one guy or two guys involved in this deal with the minister and the investor. And so the the legal process put in place was full transparency, public announcements of meetings to be held, and then meetings held with anyone who'd come who was involved. And then later on, once the things were explained, if people, before anything could be signed, there was a process where you could object by you not being there and stuff. So we had to build this process in of transparency and involvement of participation. And so basically, if the people make the decision with, with a full free prior informed consent, then it is a decision. Hmm. So uh, we're here at school talking about systems change. Um, Malago thinks you can't get to system change without starting with behavior change. So impact comes from getting yes. someone to do something differently. So I want to make sure everyone leaves today understanding, like for each of you, exactly who needs to do exactly what differently to accelerate the possibilities that you see here. Um, Ralph, why don't you start? <laughs> no. Go, go on. Pacho. <laughs> really simply, like who needs to do what differently? The government needs to something. Or... Uh, there, there, there are several actors. I mean, from the government. Just one. And... Just one. Choose huh? one. Choose one person you want to do something differently. One actor. The government, the presidency has to understand that indigenous peoples are the way out to govern the territory, to govern the Amazon. Okay. And that they are the allies and they are not the opposition. They are okay. not an obstacle to development. They are the way forward. Okay. Understanding isn't really doing something, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carolina. Escuchados. Bueno, la verdad que para nosotros los indígenas siempre nuestro sabio ancestros nos ha dejado un mensaje para poder entender nos toca entender es las visiones porque tenemos diferentes visiones y también cambiar las conciencias la, como nuevas semillas en pensamientos a dónde de dónde de qué es que estamos viviendo cuál es nuestra herencia de aguas, de alimentos, de aires, de dónde, de dónde viene eso y cómo podemos vivir. Yo creo que es eh, por eso nuestro ancestro ha dicho, el mundo primero no va a entender, después va a empezar a aparecer uno por uno para, para preocuparse. Yo creo que hoy estamos todo el mundo preocupados. Si uno que no tiene recursos, esta botella uno no puede comprar. Pues no tendría para comprar esa botella muy cara. ¿ya? Entonces, volvamos que un planeta universal, colectivo, integral, esa, tenemos que pensar a las naturalezas. Si no hay agua, si no hay tierra, no hay aire, ¿qué va a haber? No puede existir el desarrollo, ni material, ni espiritual. Entonces, nosotros pensamos en la planeta, hay un modelo espiritual y un modelo material. Cada punto, ser humano nos dejaron diferentes puntos del mundo, que hoy se está perdiendo el modelo espiritual, que es el origen de cada cosa, que está perdiendo ese conocimiento. Entonces ya no estamos viendo Thank que you. una persona es el dueño. Thank sí. you. Chris, 
Who needs to do what differently? Um, many people, many things, but I'll focus just on this crowd here, mostly civil society and donors. Um, land is the best investment in time and money, uh, and it's not, a lot of folks are not connecting the dots, and so I would push more people to get involved in land rights, whether it's community land rights, land rights for women, land rights for farmers. And make the check payable to <laughs> <laughs> Not, to, not just Jennifer. Lendessa, there are many groups all over Good. the world now working yeah. on land rights. Good. Jennifer. Um, I would say that, um, well, they've covered government, uh, CSOs. I'd say the people need to understand that indigenous peoples hold the key to um, a lot of the problems that we're facing, such as climate change, the problem with biodiversity loss, and that um, they should be supported to keep doing what they've been doing since time immemorial. And Ralph? I think uh, people who have the power should share power. They should not be afraid to do it and they should allow it to be shared by legislation and, and do, do the acts that need to happen so that some of your power is taken and given to someone else. Excellent. Well, there's so many topics that we didn't get to cover today, like climate change, which is so relevant for both Vanuatu and the Philippines. I hope you'll come up and talk to the speakers afterwards for a second. Um, I also wanted to read a quote to you from Gone with the Wind, just to end. So uh, Scarlett O'Hara's father says to her, says to Scarlett, the land is the only thing in the world worth working for, worth fighting for, worth dying for, because it's the only thing that lasts. <laughs>